Well, what is up and good morning, CBG. Oh, so good to see you. If you are new, my name is David. I'm one of the pastors here. If you were here last week and you came from the north, like from Parkland, Palm Beach County, who forgot about the sawgrass being closed? Anybody? Raise your hand. Be proud. Come on. Own it. Own it. I did. I did last night. It'll be fine next week. No traffic issues next week. So glad you're here. I want to jump right into it. If you missed the last couple of weeks, we're in this conversation. We call it a theme or a series, uh, studying a remarkable time in the history of the people of God. It's in the book of Exodus. It's when there's this transition from bondage to blessing. And I thought it'd be a good segment in the history of God's people to study because some of us, we have dysfunction in our life. We have issues. We have hurts and hangups and habits. And we've tried to change in the past. I mean, you tried hard. I mean, you welled up your resolve. You prayed about it. You brought some other people into the process, but you failed. You didn't change. So after a while, you stopped trying. You just learned to live with it. You you limp through life with this thing. You think you got it covered. And guess what? Some of us are pretty good. Put up the facade that we're cool, but we say that we're fine. We're okay, but we're not. We know some part of our life's a hot mess. Or guess what? Some of us don't even try anymore. We just know everything in our life is a dumpster fire. And that's who we are. But how about this? How about year 2024? It's the year that we finally get ourselves free. It's our year of spiritual emancipation, that hang up, that habit, that addiction, that toxic behavior in Jesus' name. Let's see authentic and lasting change. Now, the first step is to own it, to take responsibility. Back in the 1930s, uh, uh, Smith and Wilson came up with these 12 steps. They're now the basis of every recovery group like AA or Celebrate Recovery here at the church. And the first step is basically saying, hey, I, I got an issue. Right. Here it is. Uh, a part of my life is unmanageable. And that's hard to own sometimes. It's hard because denial is our first response often to dysfunction. Yeah, right. Look, y'all staring at me like it's not true. <laughs> I'll give you an example for my life. It's kind of a weird dysfunction. Uh, Lisa and I, we live here in, in Broward County. If you're watching in some faraway place, so South Florida, it's the Burbs. Uh, and, and we live our house in a shallow cul-de-sac. We just have two neighbors. And the neighbors are super nice. It's very private. One reason is because we got this, uh, I think they call it a preserve, like a nature preserve. Like we're near the Everglades. I don't live against the Everglades. But like four or five acres of like the community property. And it's like jungle or woods or what have you. And so our human neighbors never bother us. But other neighbors do. We get critters. We get critters. We get animals that visit our house from time to time. And we've had the usual. We've had, you know, we get, you know, uh, you know squirrels and those buffo toads and things like that. Uh, but we get bush bunnies where I live, little cute uh, brown uh, wild rabbits. I know they're cute. But other things are not so cute. We had a bobcat in our backyard. Yeah, right here in the city, a bobcat a couple months ago. And then uh, a coyote. Okay. Yeah, actually, I have video. Lisa got her phone, and here, in, against that nature area, that big yard area, yeah! I know if you live in Wyoming and you're watching this, that's not a big deal, but here, that's a big deal. We had a coyote. So we have all these animals. So I shouldn't have been surprised when Lisa's friend, Anastasia, who was visiting from Ohio, uh, came in the house and said, I think I saw a rat in your garage. Now, let me just stop right now. Let's stop right now. Uh, last week when I spoke, last time when I spoke, yeah, I took a shot at, at, at Disney movies. I took a shot in past and I said, I'm not a big fan of the newest generation of Disney movies. I don't like their social messaging. I, I don't, I, the, the, the values don't align with the Bible. So I just, I just said that and I probably made somebody mad when I said, I don't like the new, so if I made you mad, I'm going to make you mad again. So, so here, uh, there's another movie that, that I, I have a little issue with. It is Ratatouille. It is Ratatouille. Now, don't look at me like that. It is a great movie, actually. It's charming. I love the characters. It was critically acclaimed, made a lot of money. I watched it multiple times when Zane was a little boy. So, yeah, I like Ratatouille. But what bothers me about Ratatouille is the premise for me is problematic. I mean, just think about it. It's about a rat infestation in a restaurant. I'm not okay with that. Even the opening sequence, you know, remember the the little old lady that these rats invade her home and hundreds or thousands of rodents are in her house. Oh my God, I'm not okay with that. 
And, and the reason I got to bring it up, I have now some personal trauma because, again, Lisa's friend said, I think I saw a rat, but she's from the Midwest, farm country. And I'm thinking, we've never had a rat in our garage, not one time in 12 years. There's not a rat. But then Charlie, a week later, said, Dad, I think I saw a rat. But my oldest son, you might know, is nearsighted. I'm like, you didn't see a rat. You didn't see a rat. But we're coming home from church. Lisa, what, like a month ago? It was December. And the whole family's there, and we pull up, it's nighttime, and so I hit the little garage door clicker, and the garage door goes up, and the light comes on, the light stays on for, what, two minutes in your garage, where it turns itself off, and all of a sudden, Lisa's on her phone, we're unpacking the car, and I look, and I'm like, Lisa, I think I saw a rat. She said, did, did, did you see, you didn't see a rat, you didn't see a rat? I said, what, no, I just saw a second one. Like, one ran across the floor, and one popped out of the side, and we're like, oh my goodness, Anastasia was right. And we all get out, we call Victoria and Zane, they're inside the house, they go around the house, don't come through the garage, don't you dare come through the garage. And you come, and we're all standing like 10 feet away from the edge of the garage, and the door's open. I pulled the car around because those lights inside the garage eventually go off. I'm not gonna walk in there and flip the switch. So the headlights, I'm, I, we're watching, and it was like whack-a-mole without hammers, like they just pop up, like one will pop up there and one, but it wasn't one whack, uh, rat, there's like a family now. We have an infestation. In fact, we have these racks on the side of the garage. We keep all that stuff that you keep in your garage, like AC filters and, and you know, tools, which I never use. And, and uh, oh, the Christmas decoration, the Christmas decoration on that, ra on that rack, like the Christmas trees over there and the giant Christmas tree bags. We use a fake tree like Jesus did and uh, decorations there. And we're just seeing you know, them pop out over there like it's a habit trail back in the day. We're like, oh, and Lisa's like, we're putting up no Christmas decorations. And we didn't. And again, the movie's all cute and stuff, but these rats didn't offer to make me dinner one time. So what did I do? What did, what did I do? We called the exterminator. Like first thing the next morning. He said, we can be, I can be the Thursday. Uh-uh, I need you here today. We got rats in our garage and they got to go. I'm not okay with rats. And so Steve, the exterminator, did come, and he brought those traps, brought those traps. And somebody here, you love all animals because you love animals, right? That's great. And go, oh, David, I hope you got those humane traps where you catch them and release them. And I did. I got traps where we caught them and released them to heaven. Because <laughs> I am not okay with rats in my house that close to my family, because they are vermin, they are not cute, they carry diseases and they have droppings and they're gross, and so that offends you. I'm, I don't mean to offend you, but I'm not okay with rats. I mean, Lisa was so freaked out, she said, if they get inside the house, we're just selling the house right now, just done. <laughs> Calling the realtor right now. Okay, maybe you grew up with rats. I don't, I don't mean real rats with fur, they cheese. Maybe your rats you grew up with were poverty or ignorance. Uh, uh, maybe infidelity, maybe in your family growing up, uh, no one ever kept their job, no one ever stayed married, no one ever got their degree. Uh, maybe there was debilitating debt and financial pressure all the time, you felt that stress as a kid, that, that rat kind of eating your, your joy up. Or maybe you're on the other side, maybe you had lots of money in your family, but your family is horribly superficial, materialistic, judgmental. Let the Holy Spirit play divine exterminator to your rats, and let's get you free. Let's get you free. Are you tracking with me? Exodus chapter 15, 16, we've got a lot to study. It's a rich, rich, rich text. I'm going to study the Bible verse by verse. Now, as we first read this, uh, you're going to think it's about provision. I'm all about divine provision. Provision is a big thing. Let me show you, like, uh, verse 4 seems to be about prov for provision. It is. It says in verse 4, read with me, it's on the screen. Then the Lord said, I will rain down bread from heaven for And I like to circle a verse like that in my old school paper Bible and put stars next to it and name it and claim it. Because I believe God does provide for his people. I think every good thing you have, the singular source is God. And I know you worked hard and you got your degree and you hustle and you grind and make your moves. But who gave you your talents and who gave you your intelligence? And who placed you in America? Yeah, flawed, but the land of opportunity. You can be just as smart and live in communist Cuba, and you'd be broke. So all of it comes from God. 
But you got to be careful to pluck a verse like this and make it your own, because I think there's a context for this verse. I think this unique provision was for a unique generational circumstance for the people of God in this time called the Exodus, the 40 years from when Pharaoh said, y'all get out of here, to when they finally take possession of the promised land. And so why, why, why are we studying this particular passage? I mentioned week number one in case you missed week number one. It's crazy with the 10 signs or wonders or plagues. No, call it what you will based on what side of the story you're on. For God's people, the slaves, they were wonders and signs. For the slave masters, they were plagues. We're not sure how long it took. Did it take months or weeks or just days? But I, I do know this. It just took a short time to get God's people out of Egypt. But it takes 40 long years to get Egypt out of God's people. Because they still think like slaves. They have the mindset of bondage. And if God's going to change your life and change your habits and change your toxic behaviors, the first thing you must do is change the way you think. Here we go. A little verse by verse. I love Exodus chapter 15. It seems like it's about provision. It is, but the ultimate thing is about freedom. Verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam uh, and came to the desert of Sin. Interesting name, the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. We all know that, of course. On the 15th day of the second month after they come out of Egypt. By the way, really quick thing about verse 1. It just seems like erroneous detail. It's not. I love when the Bible gives us geography and chronology. We find out where they were, were and when they were there. See, if you get geography and chronology, you know it's history, not mythology. Whoa. Stay with me. And all those other ancient religious fables like Greek and Roman mythology, they never give you the place. They surely never give you when it happened. But the Bible is like daring you to cross-reference this historical story in the historical record. You'll see it's true. It really happened. Do your homework on the Bible. Anyways, verse 2. In the desert, the whole community <laughs> grumbled. I love that word, grumbled. Against Moses and Aaron? Are you kidding me? The Israelites said, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out. Just stop, just stop. On the screen right now are two of the stupidest verses in all the Bible. People say some dumb things in the Bible. This is about as dumb as it gets. So they're on the journey to the promised land. They've known freedom for just a short season. But when things get a little tough, they start to grumble. They grumble and they say, if only we had stayed back in Egypt. In Egypt, we had meat. We had meat. We had, we had meat. Oh, we, we had it for free. It was not free. It was not free food. They were slaves in Egypt. They were in bondage. In, they were oppressed in Egypt. And the meat they had, let's drill down on the meat. What kind of meat do you think they had? I guarantee you, not prime rib or filet mignon. I mean, the Egyptians ate the best stuff for themselves. And then we know the Egyptians loved their pets. They had dogs and cats as housemen. They gave the next stuff to the dogs. What was not fit for the dogs, they gave to the Hebrews. But we had all we wanted. Here's the crazy thing. If, if, Dysfunction has been in your life for a long time, years or decades or even generations, and you step into freedom. I told you week number one, when that first happens, you grow up especially in dysfunction, in poverty or ignorance, or everyone goes to prison or what have you. Uh, nobody stays married. If you grow up just fighting, people just saying horrible things to each other, you know it's wrong. You know it's dysfunctional, but dysfunction is all you know. And so that you know it's wrong, it feels normal. And freedom feels scary. And what you'll do on top of that is this, when freedom feels scary and gets kind of tough or your freedom is challenged, you'll go back to your season of dysfunction and you'll romanticize that season. You'll think about just the few good things in this horrible, toxic environment and you'll romanticize it. So they're slaves. They're oppressed day in and day night, and day, day in and day, day out. And, and listen, if you're a slave, you're a slave. You're so dehumanized and victimized. If you're a slave, your only value to the slave master is what you can produce. Stay with me. What you can produce is a big deal. I want you to be a productive person. God's given you gifts and aptitudes and abilities and opportunity. Maximize all that. Be a productive person, but you are more than just what you produce. You have value. 
You are God made. You are God loved. And this God wants a relationship with you. has a purpose. You have so much intrinsic spiritual value. You are made in God's divine image. But when your freedom gets tough, you'll look back at your past that was broken and dysfunctional. See, the whole thing in Egypt, when Jacob went there with his family 400 years before, there's 400 years between Genesis and Exodus. When he went there first, it seemed good. It seemed okay. It seemed like a healthy relationship. But that healthy relationship turned toxic right away. A lot of y'all had a healthy relationship, you thought, at first. He seemed great. She seemed awesome. But it changed. But when you break free and get lonely, you look back. Well, well, I know he lied to me. He cheated all the time. But at least I wasn't alone. I had a date for New Year's Eve every year. Oh, yeah, Whew, those collectors called me at my house. Those collectors, debt collectors called me at work. That was so embarrassing. I had all this max out credit cards. I was so stressed out, but I got my nails done every week. <laughs> my shoes were incredible. <laughs> Be careful you don't romanticize the season of your slavery. <laughs> I'm preaching good today. I'm preaching good today. Stay with me. All right, here we go. got to pick it up, pick it up. A little more detail in verse 4. Verse 4 on the screen right now. Verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread. Here's the context of heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, gather enough food for that day. In that way, I will test them. I will test them. I say three. Shout the word out, test. One, two, three. Sometimes as God begins to bless you, he will test you initially. Why does he test you? Is he mean? Is he cruel? No, he's He's trying to measure, do you have this sufficient spiritual capacity to bear up under the responsibility of the blessing he wants to bestow on you? So there's a test. you got to pass the test. Like, it's not a sermon about tithing, but I mean, more people, they try to tithe, and they come back like a month later and go, oh, my gosh, it doesn't work. <laughs> You've been doing this for three weeks, hang in there. Then verse 5, on the sixth day, uh, they got to pick up and prepare twice as much. See, the sixth day gets you ready for something called the Sabbath. God wants one day in seven days that you protect for worship. For worship. Not travel sports. I'll move on. Not travel sports. Travel sports are great. But one day you protect your time in God's house and you refuel and re-energize your battery. So one day, collect twice as much. It's cool for one day, and it won't go bad. This is such a rich text. Really quickly, a couple things. i got to shut this down because i got to get you back to your cars, leave the parking lot to the next crowd. Get here. Here we, here we go. Here we go. I wrote down these things thinking about this great, great passage. And, and by the way, uh, there is a title for the sermon. There's a title for the sermon. Guys, I'm going to skip a whole lot of text right there, so I'm not long today. Just Here's the title for the sermon. It's entitled... Manaology, manaology. There is so much, I know it's a fake word, manaology. There is so much truth and revelation baked in to manna. Manna is the bread from heaven, it's the chief nutritional fuel for their journey to freedom. Here we go. I wrote down these ideas. I'll cover as many as I can in the time we have. Number one, it was provision for a real problem. Provision for a real problem. Um, Okay, so that first verse about the second month and 15 days in the second month, like what does that even mean? It means they're, they're, they're one month out of Egypt. That means all the food they packed for the journey, everything they put in their backpack is gone. All the gummy bears are gone. The Lunchables are gone. The Flaming Hot Doritos are out of that. And so if you're a father or a mother, you're worried about your family. I've got to feed my family. That's a real problem. Some of us grew up worried about the next meal. That's a real problem. So the issue is not acknowledging the problem. Acknowledging a real problem is part of your healing. It's that first step. The issue here in this passage is the way they articulate the problem. Their attitude is they express it. They grumble against God. They grumble against Moses. Listen, he's pretty much a perfect pastor. And they grumble against him. They are so negative. Where are my negative people in the house? Raise your hand for negative people. You're not going to raise your hand, aren't you? Aren't you? Don't raise your hand. Don't. But if I ask people, do you know someone that, do you know someone negative? Raise your hand if you know someone. Raise your hand. Oh, my gosh, they're out there, aren't they? I know we live in a culture that is so critical, but in Romans we're called not to conform to our culture. You don't think our culture is critical. Go to some famous person's social media. Go to the comment section for like 90 seconds. We are so negative. But God's people were called to be accurate but not negative. They grumble. 
It's a theme in the story. In fact, I, I wrote down all the times they grumble. Like in this verse, it's so funny. Uh, Exodus 14, 12, they grumble. 15, 24, they grumble. Here in 16, 2. Uh, 17, 3. Numbers 14, 2. 16, 11. Uh, 16, 14. It is a horrible, unholy habit. So I'm talking right about my negative people. In Jesus' name, stop it. In fact, you won't even acknowledge your negative because we take these little words and we create these benign terms or pet names for our sin. You know, I'm not negative. I just, I'm a perfectionist, you say. I have a critical eye. I'm just keeping it real. No, you're really wearing us to slap out. So in Jesus' name, let's stop global whining. Amen. Let's stop global whining. I wrote this down. God provides, God provides, but you still have to do the work. I was just thinking about this story. God is unlimited. So to get his people from bondage to the promised land, he could have snapped his divine finger and just teleported everybody. It happens in the Bible. He teleports, uh, he teleports uh, Elijah, goes to heaven in a fiery chariot, doesn't even die, right? That's kind of a cool way to check out. Uh, uh, Philip, when he baptizes the man from North Africa, the Ethiopian man, the moment he brings that wet believer out of the water, it says the Spirit of the Lord snatched away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he shows up in a place called Azotaz. That's 20 miles away. How cool would that be? So God could, God could say, okay, you're now in Egypt. Poof, you're in the promised land. But he doesn't. they got to follow him a step at a time, a day at a time in faith. Life is a journey. And uh, even the way the food is delivered, the manna is delivered, it's out in the field in the morning. God didn't have to do that. Got angels delivered to their tent. Knock on the flap. Divine door dash. How fun would that be, right? How about, we'll serve it up to my people because we love them so much. Every day they get manna, and, manna breakfast in bed. You get your manna waffles, your manna pancakes, right? Your manna croissants, your manna bread, all that right there for you. All that. But no, to get it, you had to wake up, get up, and make stuff happen. You with me? They had to get up on time, had to go out to the field, had to collect it, had to measure it, had to dispense it, had to retrieve it, and then they had too much, they had to dispose of it. Because you got it in one day's dose. I didn't read that, but anything you kept more than one day, the whole thing went bad. The whole day, so one day at a time. So you had to partner with God. God provided, but you had to do your part of the equation. Now let's put the first two ideas together. I must own and take responsibility for the fact that I got rats. Right? Anastasia's wrong. We don't have any rats or whatever. No, we had rats. And because I didn't take care of the first rat, I had a manifestation of an infestation. Right there, had this rat family. They never made me dinner one time. <laughs> All right, so I got an issue, but God's going to provide freedom, but I must do my part. So let me give you an example in your life. Should we talk about your relationships or your habits or your addictions? Well, let's make it really comfortable. Let's talk about money. <laughs> but listen, I, I'm not, that was like three people having the courage to laugh. Thank you, Heather, you're one of them. Oh, look, we hear this. I'm not going to ask for your money. I'm not going to ask you money. I'm not going to talk about offering or giving at all. But listen, if you have financial stress, you are normal. Yes. Americans, we do a lot well. We do not educate our kids how to manage their money. In fact, I grew up, there weren't even classes like that in school. They're now in Broward County, Florida. And they're now going to, for the first time this year, going to be mandatory financial literacy classes. That's so important. So if you're financially stressed out, you're just a good American. In fact, let me survey this. Raise your hand if you had even one day in 2023 of financial stress. Raise your hand if you had even one day or one moment. Anybody. So everyone over the age of 13 is raising their hand. Like he's like eight. He's fine, right? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't say anything. Like, everyone raise your hand. Here's my question. You have this stress, this pressure. Did you do something about it? Wow. See, we offer this thing called Financial Peace University. Right? It's on the screen right now, Financial Peace University. And Jay talked about it last week. She talked a lot about debt. And if you came for the first time, like, man, y'all hate debt. You guys, debt. Man, you're so uptight about debt. What's wrong with debt? Well, I, listen, debt's not sin, but too much debt becomes dysfunction. And the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 7, it says, if I have debt, I'm a slave to the lender. That's not my opinion. That's the Bible, right? So listen, if you feel financial frustration, it is normal, and you are not alone. 
So again, Financial Peace University, put that slide back there. There's a QR code. You can just take a picture of that. You can register. It's nine weeks, nine weeks. And here's the funny thing. Just like last night, I don't see a single phone in the house. Stop, stop. Don't, don't get in the way of the illustration there. You're like one person in the room. Uh, listen, I'm not getting on you, but I guess you're cool. You're not cool. How do I know you're not cool? I'm going to show you. Candy bars. Did y'all get a candy bar when you came in the room? Find your candy bar really quick. We're going to close with this candy bar, candy bar. By the way, at Church by the Glaze, I did not give you the snack size or the fun size. In Jesus' name, I gave you the full-size candy bar. Now, if you ate your candy bar, your issue to fix in 2024 is your impulse control, right? It's just, we're stress eating. All right, I want you to talk about money because Americans, uh, we don't handle our money very well. So when I call out your bar, I want you to hold your bar up proudly and I want you to stand up. I'm going to talk about the way Americans mismanage money. Ready? If you got a payday bar, would you stand up at your campus right now? Stand up right here and remain standing. Stand up, payday. Give it up for the payday people. Come on, payday people. <laughs> payday people, remain standing, remain standing. Y'all, by the way, this is random. I guess I'm gonna stand right now, you're as broke as you can be. But the payday represents the top 2% of Americans, not the top 2% in income, but in wisdom as you manage your money. These people have zero debts. No debt on their credit card. They pay their cars off in full. No student loan. Remain standing, remain standing. I'm so proud of you guys. The pay you manage those paydays so well, you don't even have a mortgage. Your retirement is fully funded. You can retire early. And your position, if God moves you to radical generosity, you can be generous. You maybe sit down. That's the payday, people. Stand up if you got the hundred grand bar. Where's my hundred granders? All right. You're the next 10% of Americans. You're almost as well off as the top 2%. Uh, you have no credit card debt, no car payment. You have a manageable mortgage on your home. You are funding your retirement. Now you will not retire early, but once you retire, you'll be fine. Good job managing your money. Give it up for the hundred granders. Good job. That was too easy. Let's go to the other end of the continuum. Where's my zero people? Who has a zero bar? Stand up. Give it up for the zero people right now. Lisa Hughes, you're a zero person? Oh my gosh. Now again, we're making this up. This is random. Probably a millionaire stand up. I, I don't know. But a zero bar person, oh my gosh, you have so much debt. You owe on your car. If you went to college, you still have your student loan. You carry between eight and $22,000 in credit card debt alone. Oh my gosh, you have zero savings, nada, nilch. <laughs> it would take you six months to save $1,000 for an emergency fund. By the way, the other folks have an emergency fund. That's money set aside for six months if you lose your job. You feel so much financial pressure all the time. You may sit down, may sit down. You're almost the bottom 16%. Who's at the bottom? Where are my milk duds? My milk duds. Come on, milk duds. Give it up. The milk duds. The milk duds. You're the bottom 2%. The milk duds. Come on. High five a milk dud right there. Fist bump them. They need some love. You're just like the zero people, except you have as much as $100,000 in credit card debt alone. How does someone get $100,000 credit card debt? Easy. One swipe at a time. One swipe at a time. Give it up for them as they're seated. They're seated. All this debt. Now, most of y'all didn't stand, did you? I, I left out most of the house. Most of the house. If you have a crunch bar, crunch bar, stand up crunch bar people. Come on, crunch bar people. Look at them all. Come on, make some noise, crunch bar. Come on, scream, shout, cheer. You are 70% of the American population. You have a house payment, a car payment. You carry a balance on your credit card all the time. If you bought nothing else and you won't, it would take you 193 months to pay off your credit card alone. Your retirement is zero or underfunded. So you're going to feel the crunch financially all of your life until you die. You may be seated and you may eat your candy bar. You probably need it. You probably need it. Look, y'all, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just doing that. Look, I'm just doing that to show you. Look, you're not alone. 
So I'm gonna put back that graphic for Financial Peace University again on the screen. And you can go ahead and, and take a picture of the QR code, but better yet, in the lobby of this campus or people on this side, you should register today. It, it's a nine week, it meets once a week. We charge you $25, we don't upcharge you at all. That's how much the people who provide the materials charge us. It is not a nine week course on how to give money to the church. Is this, this is about you getting healthy. As your pastor, I, I so want you healthy. I want you healthy in your marriages. I want you healthy in your, your health habits, what you eat and exercise. I want you spiritually healthy, and I want you healthy in your finances. The, it, finances, when there's dysfunction in finances, it affects everything else in your life. Puts pressure on your kids, pressure on your spouse. I mean, you can't sleep at night. So nine weeks, and by the way, really quickly, some of you charging us $25, yeah. Okay, we took an average of the people that went through and did the semester, they finished it. We took three years average. The people that went through the program and worked the program for the first nine weeks alone, and the real momentum happens after the nine weeks, they were able, between savings they could accumulate and debt they paid off, they came out ahead of $7,000 a person. So listen, you got financial rats, do something. Do something, do something. Last night, it's so quiet in here. Relax, shake it off, eat your candy bar. <laughs> eat your candy bar, eat your candy bar. And finally, I'll close this. Provision came in daily doses. It came in daily doses. You know, God didn't give him all the food at once. God didn't give him the promised land overnight. Uh, so how long will it take you to dig out the dysfunction in your life? My guess is you did not get in this situation overnight. You won't dig out overnight, but you'll get there. So, so Quincy and Portia doing the announcements, young couple, they paid off $70,000 in consumer debt. <laughs> consumer debt is debt outside of your mortgage. Um, Jade, you know, part of our church family, her and Sam paid off, it took several years, $460,000. So it takes a little work, but when are you gonna start? Some of y'all are praying for a financial miracle. Hey God, I need to win the lottery. Not gonna happen. Need some aunt never met before, gonna die and leave me money. Mm, probably not gonna happen. This is your step to freedom. This is your step. I wanna see you get free. Daily dose, daily. And by the way, final, final thought, and I'm done. Somebody here, let me just flip the whole idea of this being daily, because there's all kinds of, read the, read the text, all kinds of conversations. Just collect enough for one day. If you collect enough for two days, it all goes bad. It would spoil like maggots and rot. It's kind of gross, right? All, all go bad, just enough for one day. We trust God one day at a time. So for people right now, your dysfunction is you're grieving. You lost in 2023 something, your job, your marriage, or someone you love. You lost your mother, or you lost your spouse, or you lost a child. They're in heaven now. And you're like, how do I make it through this year? That's not the question. It's how do you make it today? When Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow will take care of himself, he's not saying don't make plans, don't have goals. He's saying, but guess what? God gives his, his grace, his power out in daily doses. I don't know how you make it through next week, but you can make it today in God's power. You can make it this week, one day at a time, till you come back here next Sunday and you find more truth in Jesus' name. So look, Lisa, Lisa, as I told Lisa, I'm gonna tell the story about the rats. Her first concern was, David, people will judge us. They're gonna think we have bad hygiene or something, that we're sloppy people and have gross things in the garage. Look, number one, Church by the Glades is a no judgment zone, amen? We don't judge each other here. But you know, we don't keep this dirty garage. We don't keep food in our garage. Our garage is relatively organized. I mean, don't judge me, I can get a car in my garage, can you? Um, judge me if, if I kept the rats. I thought, yo, listen, they're okay. I mean, they're not that dirty. What's a little disease here and there? Let's invite them in the house. If I did that, judge me all day long. If I learn just to coexist with the vermin, yeah, that's dysfunction. We dealt with it. I called the exterminator. Y'all know I'm cheap. They said, how much are you gonna charge? I'm like, I don't care. We got rats. Gonna bump them. In fact, I'll tell you what kind of trap we use. Yeah, we got these traps, like big, rectangular black things. Like, oh, they're gonna go in there and die in there because oh, that's just gross, dead rats in a box. He goes, no, they eat the little poison in there, then they run away to a water source and they die far away. I'm like, that's great. And so our, our guy put out all these traps and they work every time. When he came by two days later, later and he checked all the traps and Lisa, not a single one had the bait taken. He's like, you got highly intelligent rats. 
So you got those old school spring traps. Have you seen those like in the Tom and Jerry cartoon? The Three Stooges, we always step on the Three Stooges, right? Like, and we put those out. And I told y'all before, I don't like dead things, like dead lizards creep me out. Imagine a dead rat in a trap, but I didn't care. The first day, boom, we got one, we got Mo. And the second night, we got Larry. And the third day, we got, we got Curly, man, Chimp. I don't know what his name was. But after that, man, the rats communicated and they left. And we found the little hole. They had bit like a hole in the, in the, the, the trim of the garage, like a little, like just in the cartoons, that little semicircular hole. We plugged the hole. By God's grace, no more rats. So God's saying, I want to exterminate this dysfunction in your relationships, in your marriages, in your parenting, in your addiction. But you have to go to celebrate recovery. I hate the financial bondage you feel, but Financial Peace University in doing all nine weeks, you're gonna find the freedom. The Son is all about your freedom, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness, your love, for the emancipation that's about to become viral in our church. Father, Americans don't do this well, but the church should be different. It is not appropriate for your people to live in chains. We're too comfortable with our bondage whom the Son has set free, is free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.